just had a couple conversations with the founder and CEO of the startup I just worked for and he seemed like such a cool dude and I knew I wanted to interview him so here is the interview. I'll do a story time later on how I went about the interview process but for now just enjoy this conversation and catch you later. Awkwardly close together. Hello Brendan. Okay. So I appreciate you being on this. This is Brendan Cam, the CEO and co-founder of Thanks, and I will let you give a little pitch on what Thanks is. Sure, it's a B2B platform for building stronger relationships. Doing so through gratitude platform lets you send small gestures of appreciation, a cup of coffee, maybe a bowl of chicken noodle soup if someone's not feeling well. Just those little things that can strengthen a relationship, uh, and it takes care of all the things that can often prevent you from doing so in a business uh, relationships. There's an expense report to be done, compliance rules that need to be followed, budgets that need to be adhered to, uh, and so the software takes care of that, meaning that you, at the end of the day, can focus on your relationship and not on all the logistics behind it. Um, so thanks is all about growing business with gratitude, as you'd mentioned. So I'm wondering how you extend that practice of showing gratitude into your personal life and relationships. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I always thought of myself as a grateful person, but to be honest, uh, working here, I've been about six and a half years into thanks now, uh, it's really changed my perspective and attitude, uh, both at work and uh, in my personal life as well. The biggest thing for me is trying to instill that in my children. So I have three kids, um, they are nine, seven, and five. And so teaching them about gratitude and thoughtfulness and uh, the idea of understanding that they have things that maybe other children don't have, um, that they need to give back. I think that's been probably the biggest impact on me um, outside of work, the idea of gratitude being sort of infused in the everyday of what we do. I love that. Do you like go through a daily kind of questioning with them or like what do those conversations look like? I'm curious. Yeah, I think oftentimes it comes up um, when there's some complaining or some mm -hmm. whining going on. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the best thing is sort of that, you know, just before bed we sit, we read our books and we discuss something that we were grateful for or something that, you know, we gave back during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not always an answer. There's, um, you know, a lot of times it's just kind of like, oh, I don't want to talk about about this but I think just the process of doing that um, hopefully will instill that and that they're thinking about it as they get older um, it'll just be part of their kind of day-to-day -day. Mm -hmm. and one thing I want to mention on the business side that I think is cool is that thanks um, being a startup we have our monthly thanks days which is a cool way to have some bonding with co-workers and explain that um, two to one ratio of, right yeah. so thanks day is both uh, uh, sort of bonding fun uh, way to put some stress release off. Um, so we do a lot of kind of cool events together. We've gone uh, bowling and camping and to baseball games, whatever it might be. Um, but every third month we do something that's a, a give thanks back. Um, so we'll volunteer um, that might be at a soup kitchen or a shelter. Um, we did a landscaping project at um, effectively an orphanage. Um, and so we try to do things where um, you know, we live those values of, of giving back, um, but also are careful to give back to ourselves as well and, and have some fun. What is the scrappiest thing you've done to grow thanks? <laughs> and what, uh, what was your takeaway? Yeah, so I think um, you're always doing, especially at the beginning, everything scrappy. Yeah, okay. right? <laughs> uh, right and so, the, yeah, I mean, we're sitting in, in my office with a kind of homegrown <laughs> setup here, happy, right? Yeah. So this is certainly scrappy. Look, I've done the cliche things of, uh, you know, I didn't take a salary and I had to take out the garbage and painted an office, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, those are still just things that need to be done. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the harder things about being a founder as your business grows is letting go of some of those things. Um, it's probably one thing I get dinged down a lot from people looking in on our business and it's like, you know, you gotta do that cost benefit analysis of, you know, should you be spending the day painting that wall anymore? Or, you know, maybe that is something better to be outsourced and there's something new that would be, you know, scrappy in a different way or a business of, of this size. So. I think you're constantly looking for things. You know, to me, I kind of equate scrappy with um, doing things that you're not sure about. Um, and so it's just the next step, the thing that needs to be done, the thing that doesn't have a defined place in your business yet. Um, and that changes very much from when you're two people in a conference room to you know 50 to 100 people in an mm -hmm. office space. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> How do you protect your physical and mental health as a CEO of a high growth startup? Um, I think for me, one thing I've um, learned, and maybe this has just changed with the times as well, but I don't focus on sort of work-life balance anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just work-life integration. And so what I mean is there's times where, um, you know, it's the middle of a day Wednesday and my daughter's got her school play and I'm going to leave and go to that. Um, but there's other times where I need to be doing something and it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night is the time I found to do it. And so I don't think uh, any kind of that burnout or anything mm -hmm. because 
Um, I schedule it as just another important task. Just like we talked about with being scrappy, um, there's a cost benefit analysis to all these things and what should be done. So um, I might just have to schedule going to the gym for my physical health and treat that like I would a meeting with a client. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that can't be pushed off and shouldn't be pushed off for something else. And that comes down to you know, coaching my son's football team or dinner with the family. Um, these are very important things and tasks and projects that need to be done just mm -hmm. like things for work. And so treating them with the same sort of level of, of respect within your calendar and your to-do list as the things that are more obvious to the business, I think mm -hmm. is kind of a key to maintaining that physical and mental health. That's great. And it kind of goes back, there's like productivity concept. You probably heard of time blocking. Mm -hmm. Now you just really have to block out that time in your calendar and treat it as... Yeah, uh, we talk a lot with people here at Thanks about doing that. You can get in that stuck in that sort of gerbil wheel of um, check my email, check my mm -hmm. Slack, just go through and you're not really accomplishing too much. Time blocking can help that, but the trap most people fall into when they first start it is they block off time in their calendar and then they allow others to, they treat it still as free time. So they'll allow others to put uh, meeting times on their calendar during that time or um, you know, a boss will come in, well, it's my boss, so I, I need to do that. And you need to treat that just like you would that meeting with an important client. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't work and you don't trust yourself with your own calendar and time blocks. So. Yeah, it's like boundary setting. Totally. Next. Um, so I had a conversation, my first one-on-one -on -one with Brendan um, as an intern a couple weeks out. And one thing that struck me about you is just how curious you are as a person. He studied media um, at college. No formal business training, no formal psychology training, and you seem so like passionate and just engulfed in that world. And I'm curious, I'm curious if that um, level of curiosity is something you've just grown up intrinsically having, or like how do you foster that um, practice of continuous learning and lifelong learning? Yeah, I think um, I've definitely always been a very sort of curious person. I was, um, I think my parents would have described me as very imaginative as a child. Um, part of this honestly stems from a bit of um, uh, skepticism too, right? I don't, I'm not one to just kind of trust that, hey, here's an expert and they're telling you what to do or the way to do it. Um, and that sort of naturally leads you down a path of, uh, you know, trust but verify. It's not that I think it's necessarily wrong, but I want to understand well, where did that come from, right? Mm -hmm. That anytime you read a headline or anything, it's like, well, is that really what's happening here, right? And um, you mentioned sort of in college, um, I actually started as a political science major, right? And one thing you learn with political science um, besides the fact that it's definitely not a science, is that um, it's about persuasion and psychology, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what politics is. And so um, when you realize that and combine that with media studies and understanding how they're very closely related, um, you can see how I kind of got down that path um, mm -hmm. with that curiosity of, hey, I'm doing clinical science. It's a pretty common major at my school. Um, but wait a minute, this is very closely infused with media and popular culture, which is another area that's always been interesting to me. Um, and suddenly you're like, wow, these are very influential and the thing you're reading or the thing you're being told is not necessarily factual, right? It's just um, pushing you in a direction and a narrative. Mm -hmm. And so I just find a lot of interest in deconstructing those things and understanding, well, why is this being told to me and what should I really take away from it and what's the opposite of this, right? So mm -hmm. finding both sides or three sides to a story has just always been really interesting to me and, and then trying to get further down into, well, you know, why? what's the motivation, why, right? Why, why? Um, which has become very... Um, sort of mainstream now, uh, but you know, in the early 2000s, this was a little less. You know, obviously, you knew there was some bias in media, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't like a front page story that you know everyone took aside and that was it. Yeah. So it's interesting to see it all kind of come to a head in recent years as well. This is reminding me of a, a recent article I read about like companies that practice innovation versus those that don't, and they were saying that like a leader, the worst thing they can say is it's always been done this way. Mm -hmm. Curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's very true, right? Um, Why well, just recreate what's already there? Uh, and that's not to say there's not some value in, in sort of incremental improvements, mm -hmm. but you don't go into a startup and start a whole new business uh, because you're looking to make incremental improvements and so you think there's a better way to do it. And so I think that's why, you know, a lot of people are drawn to startup versus uh, corporate world. Um, they're looking for that sort of step change, mm -hmm. not the, oh, I can make this 3% more efficient. Um, and it's just a very different sort of attitude to take towards those things. Love that. You're such a good speaker. Um, Thanks, Al. You're welcome. So you played college basketball. I did. Grew up as a competitive athlete. What was the biggest lesson you took from basketball, and how did those skills translate into your role as a CEO? I think one of the things that's really important to remember is um, where your skill set lies. It doesn't mean you can't prove on various things, but there's certain things you're going to be better at or not as good at. And there's just, frankly, certain things that... Um, 
you're never going to be able to do. I'm always going to be five foot nine. That's not ideal to play college basketball. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know there's a certain uh, way I need to play the game, right? I'm, I can't come in and be the center as much as I might want. <laughs> um, and that's fine, right? This goes back to almost that grateful attitude of um, this is what I have and I can make it work. I just have to figure out if this is what I really want to do. What are the skills that I can have that make me really valuable? Because it's probably not going to be dunking the basketball. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, I can become an amazing leader or passer, right? I can lead my team in assists. Um, it's just, it's understanding that and going for it in a way that you understand, you know, surround yourself with the people who can make you better mm -hmm. means being really self-aware of what you're good at and what you're not. And that is very obvious on something like a basketball court. It can be less obvious in business or um, it can be a little harder maybe to admit it to yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So just understanding you don't know everything um, and having the right people around and understanding when to separate yourself from the people who aren't the right people mm -hmm. to help you succeed. I think those things all, all kind of go hand in hand. I was a very good basketball player because I was very good at making others better at basketball. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? And so I try to keep that sort of mindset here of like, I don't know how to do everything and I'm not going to be the best at anything here, but I can help find the people and train them to be the best because mm -hmm. um, they're going to be better than me at whatever that particular job is. Mm -hmm. Did you how did you feel like there were any friction points with like delegation at the beginning? Because I know that's a big thing and something I'm struggling with as an early founder of like how to relinquish ownership and really have that self-awareness of like, how, how do you make the decision of like, okay, I'm, I'm not a great programmer, but either I can learn, learn this programming language and there's the opportunity cost to that. Right. Let me just outsource and delegate and focus on what I'm good at. Yeah, I mean, it's often just a resources, especially at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of have to do everything. Um, I would say, uh, I know we're talking about sort of what you're good at or not, but at the beginning, it's probably a little bit more of like, what do you hate doing? Yeah. Because there is a burnout factor, especially early on when you are doing basically everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably more important than whether you're good or bad at it. It's more about if I just hate doing this thing, I'm not going to last. And that's the first thing I think you need to look at, at outsourcing mm -hmm. or finding a partner for or whatever it might be. Um, so again, being just truthful with yourself, if there's a piece of this business that you really don't like doing, you can't spend half your day doing it because you're going to burn out on that. So that kind of shifts over time as you get into, you have more resources, maybe you've raised money um, or have a really great business partner or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, that gives you the opportunity to then really assess your skill set and say, okay, how can I help this business? I may enjoy doing this, but I'm, I'm just not the best person to do it. Mm -hmm. um, or I understand how to do it, but my technical skill on it's not as good. So I, I need to be able to find someone I can communicate with and get them to build my vision. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that shifts over time as well. And so the harder part might be becoming when to understand like that trade-off um, of what you're doing versus what you're not and what the return is on, on having someone else do that. And it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, obviously, Definitely. which is tough. <laughs> yeah, and, and also you'll get it wrong. Yeah. You just will, right? You'll either have the wrong person or it was the wrong thing to kind of outsource and you're, maybe you're not ready to communicate your vision. Mm -hmm. And so you need to hold on to that a little longer until you can get that out. So it's case by case and it's not a smooth process either. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I have another question that just popped into my head. Sure. Um, with your morning routine, is there a certain aspect of that routine that is like a non-negotiable for you? Um, hmm, that's a really good question. I don't think so. And the reason why is that I try to be consistent to a point, mm -hmm. um, and then I purposely want to change the way I'm doing things. It keeps life fresh in a way, um, and so I won't have the same morning routine for like six straight months. I may have the same one for two or three months, and then even if it's going well, I'll look to change that up. If it kind of flows throughout my life. Um, when I look at my productivity systems or how I handle uh, my to-dos and next steps, I will often um, every quarter or so sort of refresh it. Mm -hmm. I'll purposely move to a, a new tool or a new way. Um, one, to learn, it's that curiosity, right? But two, it just, it's very easy to sort of not see things anymore if you keep the mm -hmm. same routine. Um, even something as simple as how I get to work, I'm very cognizant of like making sure I'm not doing the same thing every single day. Doesn't mean I can't take the same route twice, obviously I'm gonna yeah. do that, but um, certain days I'll just switch it up or try a new road or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And it's that same like, I just hate the idea of getting stuck in like that's routine and I'm not even thinking about it anymore. Mm -hmm. so maybe I'm missing something. So I'll try it out and maybe it's better, maybe it's not. Um, but it gives me a sort of new perspective and a fresh eyes on things. Mm -hmm. I was thinking this past week, kind of reflecting on the internship and everything in this concept. I talked to Wes about all these intellectual things quite often, our director of engineering, about um, like seeking novelty. I mm -hmm. think especially in entrepreneurship, it's, there's a debate of nature versus nurture, but I think it's important to like just be constantly seeking novel things and have that um, like big five trait of openness really 
engaged. So it just reminded me of your. I think you're absolutely right. It's that work. that basic idea of like the best breakthroughs and ideas are going to come from two things that appear to not be connected, and mm-hmm. you connect them in a novel way. The only way to do that is to have novel experiences and be curious about, you know, could these things be connected? Is there something there? Um, and so I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Last question. Sure. Um, okay. If you had one message to share with the world, what would it be? Well, I'm certainly going to have to um, go with the idea of being grateful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that seems very simple, but uh, it can take a lot to be grateful, especially if things aren't going so great. Yeah. Um, look, the world's not fair, right? As much as we can strive and should strive for having a you know, situation where everybody's got the same opportunity and the same skills and whatever else, it's just not the way mm-hmm. the world works. Um, and so you have to start from a place of um, being grateful for what you do have. Um, I certainly wish I was six foot nine and not five foot nine when I'm on that basketball court. I'm five foot nine, and that's okay. You know what? That makes me a little quicker than some other people, right? Um, so understanding that, being grateful for what you do have, and then getting to where you want to be by using those those skills or resources or whatever it is you may have. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's always going to be someone who's, you know, it's not fair because they're they don't have those things that you have. But there's always going to be those people who have so much more than you, and you're looking at them going, man, if I just had that. You know, I would, I'd be able to do everything I wanted. Yeah. Um, and recognizing that, one, that's probably not true. <laughs> Everyone's also got their struggles, right? Um, but two, look, I can be grateful for the things I do have and make the best of that and keep improving. And, and I do have agency in that. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. Well, thank you for this interview. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Guest number you. one. Thank you for interning this summer. Yeah, it was fantastic having you. Hopefully we'll, we'll see you again soon. It's bittersweet to leave. <laughs> it really is. Okay. Thank cool. you. Thank you.